Well, good afternoon. It's Roger Gilbert here of Milling and Grain magazine. I'm in the Rongo Rongo live studio once again, uh, introducing this month's edition, or the June edition, of Milling and Grain magazine. Here it is, hot off the press. Uh, it's been online for a couple of days now, and uh, you're more than likely to see it arriving in the mail over the next week or so, globally. Uh, I am in the company of Vaughan Entwistle. He's our managing editor, and he's going to tell us today a little bit about uh, the magazine and its content. Uh, welcome aboard, Vaughan. Thank you, Roger. How's, how's things? How's, how's it going there in uh, Parandale at um, Milling and Grain? That's pretty good. It's another lockdown in the edition, but we're still managing to get them out on time and they're looking really good. Now, you may notice for this edition, I'm wearing a Bueller shirt. Yes. It's not any sort of favoritism for Bueller, that's because I got this shirt at a trade show and I'm cheap. So, if you want me to wear your shirt, send me a shirt now, wear it on this, these. Uh, well, podcast. Well, thank you very much, Vaughan. Uh, <laughs> look, if anybody wants to take us up on that challenge, send your company T-shirt in, and we'll wear it. Uh, Vaughan, uh, you mentioned uh, Bula, which is quite appropriate, actually, because in this issue, I see you, we've got quite a good coverage of Bula and its virtual world. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think this is, was a taste of things to come. Um, this was an incredibly slick. Uh, virtual, pod, virtual uh, broadcast of uh, a, a very special program that Wilder put together. They call, also called it the Virtual Trade Show booth because they were exhibiting some of their latest and greatest products. Um, and like I said, I think this was so well done that uh, we may see perhaps more of these in the future and maybe this will become a favorite way of disseminating information about new products. So. I don't know if uh, what's going to happen with conventional trade shows. I think a lot of people may be look, we may be looking at a paradigm shift along these lines. Mm. So anyway, so um, well, just on that one, you know, I, we did both watch it. In fact, uh, quite a lot of our company tuned in. It was free to register, and it replaced. That's an interesting point because it replaced their participation at uh, Interpac, which is was to be held in the same week. Uh, in Germany, in Düsseldorf, Germany, and they put this whole thing, three-day event together online within six weeks. I mean, it was quite staggering the amount of content they had. And to be fair, the trade show itself, their booth, was very uh, succinct and only ran over five or six minutes with an explanation. But the backup content was exceptional. And, and I think, you know, the point you made, what does this mean for trade shows? We've done a uh, Rongo Rongo Live uh, video with uh, uh, VIV, for instance, who is coming back very strongly on trade shows themselves. So I, even though it might be a paradigm shift, it may well be a complementary arrangement that comes out of this. That companies will see the value in going direct, but you can't take away from the fact that we, we love getting together. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. true. So the the, uh, the Bueller virtual uh, booth program focused a lot on their, one of their new machines that's modular in construction and is used to produce very elaborate uh, confectioneries, I guess you'd call them. Everything and these, this machine is pretty miraculous. It does everything from melt chocolate and add chocolate to nuts and wafers, and it's it's a circular machine and you put start the process on one side and it goes through. And it was pretty mind-boggling uh, to see what Buller can come up with and, and the, the amazingly complex products they can make with their technology. Did you also get the impression that there was a huge emphasis on alternative grains and even alternative proteins uh, as opposed to our traditional yes. uh, meat products? Yeah, they have a lot of extrusion technology that's, it's, that, again, is quite remarkable. It's taking pulses and... and, and soybeans and things like that, and it's turning them into something that has the texture of meat, the look of meat, the coloring of meat, and you can even prepare it in a similar fashion to, to meat. You put it in a frying pan, cook it up, it changes color, and uh, that's, I think that's the wave of the future, at least uh, for people who are vegan and vegetarian, which is becoming an increasingly popular choice for food. Mm. So yeah, it's, that was pretty amazing, the extrusion technology they showed us. Yeah, but the milling industry played a very large part. 
uh, we had the grains, uh, the grains division there uh, also. Yeah. So it wasn't just exclusively on uh, co cocoa-based products or chocolate-based products. There was also a lot of grains uh, being included in that uh, presentation, those presentations as well. Uh, what else is, I mean, that was fascinating. What else have we got in the magazine that's going to uh, light up readers when they receive it? So the cover image is of uh, Cars Mills Flower Mill. Hmm. There's the flower truck below it and the mill in the background. Cars Mills is, uh, a, a, they actually have three mills. The picture on the cover is from their Kirkcaldy Scotland Mill. It's actually the biggest flower mill in the UK. They also have a mill in in uh, Essex and one in, in Cumbria. But what was interesting about this story is I've been tracking the response of the milling industry to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And they have impressed me with how they've stepped forward to do to go above and beyond what their, their normal uh, uh, bailiwick is. They're actually reaching out to the, to the community and helping them. So Cars Mill has set up a, a charity that's basically a, a, an outreach program where they've been supplying money and help to local NHS charities and, and, uh, and people who are in the, uh, the healthcare industry. Um, the story is called A Tale of Two Mills. So one of the mills is the huge monstrous uh, mill in Scotland and the other one is in Wessex. And that is a small mill, lots of degrees smaller. And it's an older established mill, and it's still being run by the same family, only now we're down to a father-daughter uh, set of milling managers who run the place. And they were the focus of uh, a number of reports from the media because uh, of how flour millers have been going above and beyond to, to make sure that the supplies of flour are, are kept going, and especially flour for the home, the home baker. So uh, they were actually featured in the Telegraph, uh, kind of a funny posed picture of, of the, the lady who's the, one of the milling managers filling a bag by hand, a one, a one and a half kilogram bag of flour. Well, they're not, they're not doing that. But they actually have had to add a Saturday shift to help fill those bags. Um, and they've been going, they've been going since uh, 1839, I think. Mm. Uh, so that was our moment of, of uh, in the limelight for the milling industry. The, the BBC actually went down there too, and even a film company from Austria, like someplace like that. Anyway, so that was that's very welcome. Um, another related story to that is about a string of artisanal bakers in Norwich. They're called the ba the Bread Source, and like I said, they're. They're artisanal. They're using older. They're using whole wheat flours and older grains and things like that. But they stepped forward also, and they put together a special package of staples. And these are exclusively for members of the NHS who have been working all kinds of hours, get off their shifts exhausted, don't have the time or the energy to shop, and so they can just walk into this bakery, and here's a collection of bread, milk, eggs, and butter, and they can just. They don't even have to to uh, stand in line. They can just walk into the place and, and give their name and pick it up and, and go home. So that's, that's another wonderful incentive that um, the uh, bakers have stepped forward to produce. I noticed, I know, Vaughan, sorry to interrupt, but I noticed that uh, the COVID is, is a hot topic again. But I mean, there's, there's a lot more in this issue. When I was looking through it, there's a broad spectrum of stories that you've covered this month. Mm -hmm. um, what about milling on the other side of the coin, you know, for, for animals or for, for the feed industry? What, what have we got around those sort of uh, topics? Let's see. Um, what was we've got uh, an article from Kemen on amino acid balancing mm -hmm. or dairy nutrition. Um, got one on grind, pre grinding and pre-grinding recipes for pet food. Okay. And then we've got an interesting one from Evonik on NIR near infrared analysis of 49 fatty acids. And these, these are essential in, in animal feeds that you have the correct balance of fatty acids. And this is online? This is online analysis? Yes, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. that's impressive. Yeah. So you know, we continue to cover very important topics. And mm -hmm. uh, it seems like everything is coming down to focus on, on the gut 
in animals and humans. I, I've been reading a lot of articles lately that they're now starting to link gut health in humans with things like Alzheimer's. So oh, okay. I think there seems to be a convergence of, uh, of, the, of, of ideas around this now. Mm. One's realizing gut health is essential for the health of the overall animal or, or human in fact. Mm. So what, what was the standout story for you? We might have already mentioned it, but what, what was the, the standout one for yourself? Uh, something I found very interesting is uh, I contacted Roth Hampstead Research, and they're, they're an agricultural research organization in the UK. They've been working on strains of wheat, and by using new strains of wheat, they've actually been able to increase the fiber and nutritional value of white bread so it's very, very close to the nutritional value and fiber content of whole wheat, uh, whole wheat bread. Wow. Yeah, so that was very interesting. I didn't know that was a possibility, but uh, there's people working on that even now. There's the standout one for me, and uh, of course it would be because I did the interview, but it was the uh, interview with um, with Pam Sun. Uh, they make it into this issue. and. Mm -hmm. uh, We've noticed over recent weeks that Samsung is taking a more Chinese company, as we know, is taking a more active global positioning. Uh, we see them constantly on social media now, but they're actually starting to play a real part in the industry. And it's not just about selling equipment, it's about supporting the industry as well. And I mean, that's worth a read uh, for anybody to get better assessment, particularly in today's climate, uh, we we need to have in our industry a better assessment of what's happening in China and how mm -hmm. Chinese perceive the global market. Uh, but that's a, a good starting point in my view and one of the standout uh, features of the magazine. Uh, anything else you want to... Uh, I guess we should point out about? that uh, in the Mag TV section of the magazine, uh, you, you did a, an interview with Chris Jackson hmm. for Rongo Rongo Live uh, about Chris Jackson's from UK Tag. Want to tell us a little bit about what that was about? Well, Chris is just sort of putting in perspective uh, the the UK's response or the response of COVID, uh, how we, how he sees COVID internationally. Uh, he's also talking about uh, the the help that industry, the governments give industry in in a global situation to combat uh, the the consequences of COVID. Uh, and uh, UK TAG, which is UK uh, Technology and Genetics, Agricultural Technologies and Genetics, uh, is, is reassessing itself under, obviously, the Brexit conditions that are coming up. Uh, we've already left the EU, but uh, that doesn't mean to say everything's fine. Uh, the government is having to look at how Britain responds, how businesses respond to uh, Brexit. And I pointed out... Uh, had an opportunity to talk to the government through Chris Jackson's connections about you know what companies can and can't do. And we have a milling directory here, which is about 25% uh, UK companies. And uh, I'm recommending that these companies should get more active internationally. In fact, it's a strong message that I want to give to all our suppliers globally, that, that they should be more active internationally, telling people what they do, how they do it, and how people can get them Get and get their products. Uh, you know, it is a global market, despite some of the situations that are developing at the moment. The food industry is particularly global, not just for uh, its supplies of raw materials, but also the equipment that we use. So um, that's a very strong message from that interview with Chris Jackson. And we will be doing more interviews with our columnists and others over the months. Uh, but um, thank you, Vaughan. You, I think that's a a very broad spectrum look at the magazine. Uh, mm. Thank you very much for all the efforts you're putting in with the team uh, at Milling and Grain. Thank you. Yeah.